conflict. It is something each and every person faces in their life. A conflict with maybe a family member, a conflict with uh, a stranger, or sometimes a conflict with a fellow Christian. What lies at the root of each and every uh, conflict? Well, what the Bible says is that conflict is always the result of pride. Now, we've looked at pride before in previous lessons, and especially I think uh, in our series, It's Not What You Think, which was our series before this one, and talked a little bit about pride in that one. And tonight, we're gonna talk about uh, this, uh, of what is humility and how can I exercise humility? Each and every one of us, whether we want to admit it or not, has an issue with pride. It is in our, literally in our DNA. It, it is part of human nature, and it's the part of human nature that we must deal with, uh, is that thing of pride. In these series of lessons, Build Below the Baseline, we are talking about examining the parts of our life that no one else sees. Now, you may think, well, pride is something that people see. And that is true. Uh, pride eventually comes out and it is seen by many. In fact, it's a lot easier to spot somebody else's pride than spotting your own pride. And, and, and that is especially true for myself. And But we're talking about building below the baseline. And as always, I'm so uh, thankful that you choose to uh, study the Bible with us on these Wednesday night Bible studies. And if you've missed any of the previous lessons in this series uh, by Brother Chapel, um, I invite you to go back through the uh, um, uh, the, the, the previous lessons there, and you, you can find those in the archive section, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, and you can pull those up and catch back up with us. We'd be glad to have you do that. And of course, if we can do anything for you uh, here at church, we'd love to be able to help you. If you have any prayer requests, put those there. Uh, put down those in the comment section. Reach out to us privately. We'd be glad to pray for you. And then, of course, if you're with us tonight, uh, comment, share it, let us know that you're here, and we're thankful that you are. We'll be in Philippians chapter 2, and I, I hope you have your Bibles, and we'll study that these out together, and we'll read the first eight verses. I'll go ahead and start reading there. It says, if there, if there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own image, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross." And so here we're going to examine this portion of scripture that Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, and he uses the ultimate example in our life of humility for them and to show them how they can have humility in their life, how they could uh, build this part of their life, this, this part of our life that is vitally important to having a steady uh, walk with the Lord and, uh, and say, this is how you do it. And he mentions Christ because truly no, no, there has never been a person that has lived on this earth outside of Christ that had a right to be prideful. Christ could have easily been that, said, I am God. I am God in form of man, but yet he wasn't. He was humble and, and he practiced humility and he gives us the exact same um, recipe, the same game plan to be humble, to practice that humility in our life. It's, we see here, it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We are to have the same mind as Christ. Now that seems very difficult to you and I, but the Bible tells us that it is a possibility and it, it describes how we can have that same mindset. You know, the definition of humility is the freedom from pride and arrogance, humbleness of mind, a modest estimate of one's worth. But yet the opposite of humility is pride. And the definition uh, 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 that we see from pride, uh, we, we know that um, it, it, it's steaming ourselves and, and thinking more highly of ourselves than we should. And But it runs, you know, pride is that thing that, that runs deep in our core. It is deep in our human nature and it's not easily rooted out. 
but we know that with God's help, we absolutely can. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 12, it says, Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. And Proverbs 22, 4 says, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Proverbs 11, 2 says, When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. And then one other verse here says, Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. That last verse we probably have uh, been quoted to more often than the others. But just several verses here from the book of Proverbs uh, on what, it, what, what a haughty spirit does, and also what humility does. You know, pride puts itself first. And we know that in our life, because if we are seeking first place for us at all times, then we know that we have an issue with pride. You know, one of the major areas in our, in our life where pride can rear its head is in the matter of social media. And look, I'm, I'm not against social media. In fact, we're sharing this uh, particular Bible lesson right now on a social media platform. It can be used for a lot of good. Uh, but unfortunately, what a lot of people end up using social media for is that matter of pride and, and to prove a, a point that they're trying to make and, and, and to prove that they're right about a particular subject. And, and then you see all these different arguments on, on social media, on, on whether it's uh, Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, wh whatever uh, form it may be. Um, you see in the comments section, uh, if you're reading the news, it's just nothing but pride, 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 pride. And it can. You, I mean, we can see that. And uh, but yet, it's you know, pride is once again. It's always easy to spot somebody else. Like, well, that person's just full of pride. But it's harder to spot in things that we we get so caught up in noticing everybody else's pride that it becomes hard for us to notice our own pride. And so, as we work through this lesson tonight, I hope that even right now you are asking the Lord, Lord, help me to examine my heart. Help me not to listen to this lesson, and Lord, help me not to teach this lesson uh, thinking about somebody else's pride, but rather help me examine my own pride. And so that we can seek to be humble. James 4.10 says, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. So what are some characteristics of someone that is humble? What are, what are the actions of a person that is seeking to walk in humility? The first action that we see, and we will study three of them tonight, the first action that we see is they seek to walk in unity. They seek a walk of unity. It says, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. A humble person is a peacemaker. Someone who walks in unity with, with others, peaceably. The Bible tells us that. Seek to live peaceably with, with all men. But, you know, this, this unity, it permeates in our culture. You know, uh, we are the USA, stands for the United States of America. But yet, if each and every one of us were honest, we could admit that in society, we're full of disunity. There's very little unity in our world. And why? Well, because disunity sells, right? If you listen to a talk show, if you watch the news, whether it's in just a political realm, in a social realm, or even in a athletic realm, a lot of times what they're trying to do is pander to strife, right? And whatever gets the crowd in an uproar is what they do, but they never seek a solution. Why? Because that's not something that we want to do. Hum humility, though, always seeks for a solution. Humility is, is, is quick to try to uh, find a, a common place. You know what humility really is, is humility seeks to even understanding that, that they're the one of the wrong. You know, humility will show forth in our ability to apologize. One of the best practices a parent can, can make outside of you know, making sure their children um, know scripture, are, are, are saved, um, they're, they're, they're in church, place where uh, the word of God is preached, and, and around friends, and those things, having devotions at, at home, all those things. One, one of the other great things is to know that their parent is real, is to understand that it's okay for you as a parent, if you're watching this and you have uh, children at home, to admit that you're wrong. 
to admit that you're wrong sometimes. It doesn't mean that you're wrong all the time. But it is good practice as a parent for your children to see, you know what, I'm sorry, I messed up on that. I didn't handle that the right way. I responded the wrong way. Would you forgive me? You see, that, that, that is humility. And that is where, uh, you know, conflict arises, by the way, when we won't admit that. But yet we can f- seek unity when we're willing to do that. A, a, a humble Christian, their motives for unity are also right. It's not just simply a dislike of conflict, and though I do think we should maybe try to dislike conflict. I mean, because there is conflict, right? People, you know, I, one of the worst things in regards to the glory of God is, is the conflict and uh, the, the, the constant bickering amongst Christians on, on Facebook and, and places like that. It, it's disgusting to the Lord. I, I truly believe that. And, and it's disgusting to look at. And uh, these fellow Christians that are arguing about things that, that don't matter, it, it's silly. And the only person that gets honored from that is, are those people and the devil, by the way. But, you know, and people that, well, I'm just earnestly contending for the faith. No, unless it's a matter of, of Bible doctrine and standing for your faith, you're just contending. And so, uh, but for a Christian that is seeking to walk in, in, in humility, it's not just seeking to avoid conflict, but it's also seeking to, uh, to have the right type of relationship, a relationship that reflects the work of God in their life. And so, and this is based on walking in unity on these four things that are mentioned in, in, these, in this verse, verses one and two of chapter two. The first thing it says is, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of spirit, if any bowels and mercy. So it's talking about, it's based on our fellowship in Christ. Our unity is based on our fellowship with Christ. And it says the first word, consolation. Now, the root word here is to console. And so here it's talking about to encourage, to comfort, to refresh. When somebody's going through a tough time, we use our words, right? And in order to come through and console someone that is hurting, right? We can refresh them. We can encourage them. We can comfort them. We have been encouraged in Christ. Therefore, I want to take my encouragement and share that encouragement with you. We see also the word love. If there be any comfort of love. So, you know, this, com- this word comfort, once again, it has the, the connotation of, of consoling, the purpose of calming. And yet we are to offer this comforting love, which is the, this agape form of love, this self-sacrificing form of love, um, because we know that we have been loved. The only type, the only way that we can love this way is if the, the dwelling of, of the Holy Spirit is in us so that we can love in that way. And we have the fellowship of the Spirit. If there be any fellowship of the Spirit, means a communion, a, a, a intimacy, a closeness, this type of relationship that, that we ought to endeavor here to have with God. We talked about that in our previous little short series there by Adrian Rogers. Because we know him, it also affects our other relationships. You know, we ought to know the Lord in, in, in a way uh, that brings honor to Him and have the right type of uh, uh, relationship with Him so that we can have the right type of spirit toward another, so that I can have the right type of fellowship with another. You know, it is hard to be right with God and be wrong with my brother. That's what the Bible teaches. And that's not just my blood brothers. That is my Christian brethren. And having that true desire of open communication You know, a lack of of communication has destroyed so many uh, relationships on this world, whether that be husband and wife, parent and child, child and parent, or even just friend, fellow Christian. Lack of communication, unwilling to speak. Why? Because of pride. Humility is found in our communication in order to make things right. Then it says, probably my favorite point here, it says in bowels and mercies. This word bowels, talking about one's abdomen and mercies, what it is speaking of figuratively is, is having is someone with deep emotions of compassion, a, a very compassionate person. This is more than just the surface ability to, to cry and to say nice words and, and, and to speak softly, but rather that person knows with a, with a heartfelt truth that you care about them, a genuine caring of needs. I've known people that can cry and do all those things, and at the end of the day, 
they probably didn't actually care. And yet I know people that didn't do any of those things, but I knew that they actually cared. Why? Because they had this, this bowels and mercy, the bowels and mercy that it's speaking of. And these four elements are the basis by which we can walk in unity with others, of having the, of uh, consolation, love, fellowship of the Spirit, bowels and mercies. And so, and then it is evidenced by the character of Christ. It says, fulfill ye my joy and that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So if we do the same word study here, we see that first phrase of the same love. Now, spiritual unity is through love, but it is not through a controlling love. I, it's not that this is not forcing everyone to think or act the exact same way. Well, that's not love at all. And so this, this isn't a, uh, a, a, about a, uh, a love that said, well, you know, you, uh, you know we can be, walk in unity if you're exactly like me. No, no. It's not it at all. Now, we are to be like God, and we'll see that here in a minute. But people get this whole thing mixed up, and, and then they end up not being able to help a fellow Christian simply because, well, you know, they're, they're different than I am. Well, we, we can walk in love, same love. It is about the love of God being manifested in us. It is about unity in the Holy Spirit, bringing us together, having the same love. And it says in one accord. This refers to being united in spirit. Unity is not kept by accident. Unity is something that you have to work on and work on and work on. Why? Because we're flesh and conflict is going to arise. Why? Because we're different people and we do have different likes and dislikes. But the way that we get past those differences is through our commonality and being in one accord. But that takes work. Just like it takes work to have a good relationship in your marriage. It takes work to have a good relationship with your children. It takes work to have a good relationship with your parents. It takes work to have a good relationship with your friends. It takes work to have a good relationship with everybody in your family. It takes work. It's always intentional. It's a purposed effort and real work. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, it says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It, it is speaking of uh, th this word of, of like, hey, this is an undertaking in order to do this, but it can be done. It can be done. To Endeavoring means to bring those parts together. And then it says of having one mind. Once again, this does not mean that we think the exact same. Too many Christians go into conflict with somebody else because they think differently. And it has nothing to do with Bible doctrine, has nothing to do with Bible principle. All it has to do with it is, is, is with their want to, to be right about a particular subject that does not matter. And because of that, they enter into conflict with people. And the only people that's honored by that is the devil and themselves. And the people that are hurt by that are people that maybe need to receive Christ. Having one mind, one focus. In fact, he tells them where they should have one mind. He tells them what can bring them to one mind. It says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, just a few verses back to your left there in your Bible, it says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. It says that one mind should be focused on the gospel of Christ. The only way that this kind of like-mindedness can take place is by everyone putting on the mind of Christ. How do I seek unity here? Well, church unity is gained when each and every member are walking in the same direction with God. Unity in the family is when mom and dad and child and everybody in the household are walking in the same uh, direction, walking with God. Unity in our Christian friendships are the exact same way. It's when we are walking together in the same direction with God. Seeking to walk in unity is a characteristic of a, a, characteristic of a person who is trying to build unity into their baseline. So walking in unity. Secondly, the person that has our actions of humility is the person that seeks to separate from contention. Verse number three says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. It is one thing to walk in unity, but it is a totally different thing to make the choice to separate yourself 
from contention. Well, see, I said some some people pride themselves uh, on on this imaginary contending with each and every person, and the only people that they're contending with is, is fellow Christians. I don't think God likes that at all. In fact, I know He doesn't. Think about you and your family. Maybe you have kids. Do you enjoy it when your children are fighting each other? I don't think so. I don't. I have four daughters. I, I, I greatly dislike it when they are arguing with each other. It does nobody any good. Why we're all in the same family? And God feels this, the same way. There are things that obviously we should contend for. Our faith and, 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 and Bible doctrines and Bible truth and Bible principle. Most of the time it's none of those things though when we talk about Christian contention. The way that you do that though, how, how do we separate from contention? First thing we do is we refuse strife. We refuse strife. It says, let nothing be done through strife. Strife is putting oneself forward or self-promotion. Self-promotion. Often one who desires to promote himself and his agenda is willing to slander, backbite, gossip, and lie about somebody else. The person who is always willing to lie about a situation, to simply bend a, a, a situation to their truth, is normally one full of pride and strife. The Bible says in Proverbs 26, 20, it says, Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no tailbearer, the strife ceaseth. It says, you want, don't want strife? Well, get rid of the tailbearer or quit telling lies. Bible says the words of a tailbearer are as, a, as wounds. They go down to the innermost parts of the belly. It hurts. A tailbearer is destructive. One who is prideful and has this strife in their life. They destroy the lives of other people. They do not care. Many times uh, they, they look at that as uh, an attack on them when it's just simply an attack of their lies. James 3.16 says, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Ever been in a situation where you're just like, this is just so confusing. I don't understand any of this. Many times, in regards to contention, is what I mean, uh, the, a type of contention, you're like, why? why? Why is this taking place? It's because envying and strife causes great confusion. You know, the world uses these tactics. Look no further than the political arena to realize that Tactics of lying and self-promotion are, are how you get ahead to realize that that's what the world does. But that is not how the Christians should operate. Our speech ought to be used for the purpose of education, of education and, and lifting up and building and empowering somebody's life, not tearing down. Now, we use our words when it comes to identifying sin and those things. But in talking about conflict, how, how, we're, how, do, how, do our, how is our mouth helping the situation? You know, the devil is the one that loves, loves it when we entangle ourselves with arguments with other Christians. He loves it when a church is going through nothing but constant conflict. Why? Because when we're sidetracked by strife, we are certainly not focused on the gospel. And so, one, we just, we're just we going to flee from any sort of strife. And then here, secondly, in regards to um, uh, and, and, uh, separating from contention, is we're going to maintain lowliness of mind. It says, or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. While strife is self-promotion, vain glory is an erroneous opinion of yourself. You think a whole lot highly of yourself than what you should. The Bible says in Galatians 6, 3, it says, For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. D.L. Moody said that God sends no one away empty except the person that comes full of himself. We have to get rid of ourselves. We have to deny ourselves. When we begin to think too highly of ourselves, it is going to cause conflict. It is going to cause contention. Why? Because we will develop a pride in ourselves that we are above any sort of, uh, of even a perceived slight. You know, if, if you can't take any sort of, um, you know, it, criticism, you know, you know, cri there are some forms of, forms of criticism that are okay. They identify maybe an area of weakness in our life that would help us to get better. And it's not coming from a critic with a heart of criticism rather than a heart of trying to help us. But yet, we take it the wrong way. Why? Because vainglory. glory. We, we think about ourselves too highly than we should. 
but we ought to have lowliness of mind. Maintaining lowliness of mind will keep us separated from contention and pride. And then lastly, we're going to esteem others better. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Let each esteem other better than themselves. This word esteem means to set value on. It means to set value on. And what should our value be on? Our value should be on someone else. There is something more important than our glory. And that's the glory of God. That's the glory of God. And if I get the glory, God cannot receive the glory. And if I am worried about self-promoting, I will not promote the gospel. I will only pr promote myself. You know, when we, are, when we sense that there is an issue of pride in our life, once again, sometimes it's hard to identify our own pride. But when we... Um, since that, the best response we have is to pray, right? It is, it, I mean, even if you sense the thing of pride in somebody else's life, it is hard to turn somebody else from their pride. Well, it, I mean, only God can do that. So pray, we pray, we pray. But a person who is building humility below the baseline, right? That's what we're talking about. will seek to walk in humility. will seek to remove himself from contention. And they're going to seek to esteem someone else better than themselves. Why? Because in doing that, they're going to realize that my need is the need to serve another's need. Serve another's need. You know, hours before Jesus himself was betrayed, he was with his disciples, and they were arguing about their place in heaven. About who would be greatest in heaven. And Christ here. He responds by telling them that true greatness is having the humility to serve. Luke 22, 27 says, For whether is greater, he that sitteth at me, or he that serveth. It's not he that sitteth at me, but I am among you as he that serveth. The greatest, the posture of, the, of greatness is the position of a servant. I see others so that I can serve others in need. The greatness of the Christian life is not in being very good at looking out for yourself, but rather being good at looking out of the, uh, of the needs of another. In fact, it mentions here in verse number four, it says, look not every man on his own things. Now, that is not to say to not look at your own, own sin and those things. What he's saying is, is don't just take your own struggles and think, and all these, and, and, and your own trials and think, well, I'm, I, I can only fix myself right now. Now, look, you have to fix yourself in order to fix others. There's no doubt about that. But if all we ever do is look at our own problems, we will never look at, at the needs of another. If all I ever do is examine my own needs, I'm not going to look at the needs of another. We all have problems that consume our, our attention, but one who walks in humility has learned how to not allow their own burdens and problems to consume them or hold them back from helping another, Right? And it says, but every man also on the things of others. That's how that verse ends. Now, that isn't saying, well, you should just look at everybody else's sin and condemn that way. No, that's not what it's saying. I'll stop talking about sin. It's talking about the needs. Characteristic of someone who is walking in, in humility is that their focus is on serving others. The Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 5, 13, it says, For brethren, ye have been called into liber liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love, and it says, serve one another. The, the person, the action of the, the humble is to serve another. The greatest example of that is Christ. That's what Paul here is writing to the church of Philippi. That's, that's what he takes these verses here in, in Philippians chapter 2. It says, be like Christ. Why? In humility. He says, yeah, I'm going to walk in unity. I, I'm going to flee from contention. And then I'm going to serve others, serve others. And in doing so, I can resist the conflict that comes in into our life and seeks to self-promote and allows pride to develop and pride causes the contention. Instead, instead rather, walk in humility. And, and that would help us to flee from these moments of contention in our lives. Hope you have a great week. God bless you.